Thank you, Brother Mangan, and you may be seated. I want to thank all the wonderful people who've had some part and allowed me this wonderful privilege of being here today. And time would fail me to say how much the meeting has meant to me, all the wonderful preaching, beginning with Brother Mangan on our first night, and then every every sermon, every day, every night, just been wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Some of the brothers of our church said today, oh, Brother Johnson, I'm praying for you. I said, well, look, brother, you don't understand. I said, not only these men, fishermen, I said, but they dynamite the hole. They don't even leave a, an amoeba or paramecium left in the hole. So that's what I have to follow today. Amen. Amen. I... I realized that last night in the analogy that Brother Williams gave of Jesus choosing 12 and one of them was a devil, most of us would like to go home with those odds. <laughs> I wouldn't mind pastoring a church like that. But uh, most of us will have to go back to situations that we may have 12 and one may be a saint and the rest of them are devils. And at best for us, we that are gleaning, searching, trying to find some nugget to hold on to, we got six sermons left. Whatever I give you, plus five good ones is following. And that's all we got to glean from left in this meeting. And then we go back to where the rubber meets the road. Where there are no nice choirs of blessings. Where everything we get, we're going to have to fight for. We want a seven day fast. Uh, a couple weeks ago and about that fourth day the Lord woke me up one night and gave me this scripture that I'm going to be reading you today in the book of Philippians chapter 3 verse 10 very familiar <clears throat> is he turning there that I might know him. That I might know him. And the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his suffering. Being made conformable unto his death. Now let's go to St. John. In chapter 12. And verse Verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came to the fellowship of the worship at the feast. The same came to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, <clears throat> and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. And Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered and said, The hour is come that the Son of Man might be glorified. God bless you and you may be seated. <clears throat> as we look at the apostolic church as depicted in the scriptures, we see a paradigm set forth there that is valuable to us. First of all, the apostolic paradigm in the role of clergy was clear. It was strong. It was central. It was unquestioned. And it carried an authority and a power unparalleled and unmatched in all times. That ministry was special because those original men, the original 11, including Paul later, 
but the original leaven, their understanding had been opened because three and a half years they'd followed Jesus. They'd seen his miracles, observed his teaching. And then in Luke 24, verse 45, before Jesus ascended to the heavens, he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And so thus when they left the Mount of Olivet to go back and be empowered at Pentecost, they left with crystal clear understandings of the cardinal truth that they would teach and impart to the world. Okay. And then at Pentecost, there was a laity a laity beginning there that joined them and hooked in tandem with them. A laity powerful in prayer. They prayed until the house was shaken. They gave themselves to fasting. They were worshipers. They were workers. And they hooked themselves in tandem with a powerful apostolic ministry. Thus with that team, powerful ministry, and powerful laity, they shook that Roman kingdom until even it was said in the household of Caesar, there were those that were converts of that, that era, the apostolic era. That's right. So powerful, they shook that kingdom. Now, their mission was this. It was simple. Everyone outside their doors was a prospective convert for that Christian. The Jew, the only common grounds that the Jew had with the early church That's great. was that, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Uh-huh. Other than that, those Jews were prospective converts and viewed as prospective converts to that young, aggressive, empowered church. They could not find friends in the pagan world. Ladies and gentlemen, there were no common grounds with that newborn, empowered church and that pagan world. And so everyone in that pagan Grecio Roman world was a prospective convert and a point of mission destiny to everyone in that new formed, empowered Jesus' name, Holy Ghost Church. And viewing it as such, that church was energized with that commission Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Hallelujah. And that existed, that paradigm existed until 313. And in 313 when Constantine came to the throne, he introduced the Constantinian paradigm. He was threatened by that church. His kingdom could not exist a separate and apart from that church. So in his idea of forming an ideal kingdom, he tried to blend imperialism with the church and thus formed a situation never known by man before, but yet dominated the pages of history even until these times. And that was simply this. He would take the church and make the church the state. And thus the state became the church and the church became the state. It was all one big conglomerate. Amen. And in doing that, he relaxed the ideas that the Christian should be aggressive and should go forth into all the world and to reach every creature and to keep pressing forward until they turn that world upside down with their doctrine. And then in the Constantinian paradigm, he produced professionally trained ministers employed by the state religion. It had designated and assigned duties which assigned them by state and that of the church to operate by authority and the power of the church and of the state. 
They were given parishes, turf, areas which included within them the sense of responsibility of the church, of the people, which would be the neighborhood, regardless of their relationship with the faith, didn't matter. If you was a bishop or a minister or a pastor and you were assigned that tariff, then everybody in that tariff or that state or that place was yours and, and they belonged to you. It included the, the domination of business and neighborhood. It, in, it, it included the domination of business affairs in other areas. It also brought into it the jurisdiction and, and, and the, the rule and, and, and involvement with the polit political situations of that, of that area. Amen. All in a neat little package where the state controlled the preacher and the preacher controlled the area and you were never to move out of that area. Everyone born in that area was your parishioner. And it was a neat little package where they trained people to do certain things. And they functioned like that. And one generation to the other generation. And you either inherited that place or the, the great head of the state reappointed someone to that place. And in that situation, we now come to an age when writers are very concerned about what's taking place in the church church world now in this book here the once and future church Lauren Mead as you read the book you can hear the man's heart break you can hear his teardrops fall as he as he cries over a church and a denomination that he loves dearly. And he says in that book, our clergy, our ministry has been reduced from one time rector or vicar, which means ruler, man with authority, man with power. We have now been reduced, he says, to just managers of a congregation where we are brought in, employed, to raise the budget, be sure the bills are paid, baptize the Christian, the children, be sure that we perform the marriages, be on the right side politically, and after that, say nothing. While he says, our congregations are crying, says, we would see Jesus. We're not interested in your robes and, and your stained glass and, and, and all your degrees. Our families are breaking apart. Our children are being incarcerated. Drugs on every hand. Sirs, what we need is someone to bring us to the cross of Calvary. Sirs, we would see Jesus. And Jesus says to this dying world that's surrounded with darkness, negativism, all your schisms and divisions, he says to this hungry world, while men are crying, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. I'm preaching preachers, we've never had it better. I'm here to tell you, now is the time. I'm here to tell you, never has the field been more ripe and ready. Sirs, we would see Jesus. I read, I read a story a while back that was still part of my thinking for the rest of my life. It said that during the World War II, some Russian soldiers had come down into Germany and Austria, France, and that area of Europe. These Russian men were from the mountains and the hills. They'd never even seen a light bulb. 
And so in pilfering through the German houses, they took their knives and cut the cords of hanging lights, saved them, brought them back to Russia, and said, we've got treasures. This thing that I hold in my hand, I'll light a room. And he said, watch. And they tied it in the center of the room. Just like they'd seen it hanging in Austria, Germany, France, and the other modern, then modern countries of Europe. And stood back in astonishment and said, I saw it work in Germany. I saw it work in Austria. You don't believe it, but I did. This thing drove back darkness. This that I hold in my hand and I saw it work. I know I can't convince you. But it did work. And they wondered why won't it work in Russia. And the poor people didn't realize to make that light bulb work, you had to have power. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 You can take a light bulb, a hundred foot of wire and all the switches. Bring it inside the Tennessee Valley Generating Station. Lay it down on the floor amongst generators. That generates millions and billions of, of kilowatts. Enough energy to light the whole southern half, central part of America. And you won't get one blink out of it until you take the card, the positive and the negative, and hook it up and then to the cart, and then you'll get some light. <laughs> Sirs, we would see Jesus. That's what our world is saying today. We would see Jesus. And Jesus is saying to the church, it's now time for the Son of Man to be glorified. What he's saying, church, it's time to show your stuff. It's time to get out of the corner. It's time to get your index finger from between your teeth and get out and point a lost and dying world to the only answer, Jesus. It's time he be glorified. Can you put your hand together and praise the Lord somebody? Amen. Now, here's where we are. <clears throat> we'll buy tapes. We'll buy books. We'll get all the tools and we'll bring it to hungry towns and hungry congregations and say, man, I know this works. Acts 19. I know this works. Acts 19. I know this works. I read about it. I, I, I've seen it. I was there when they demonstrated it. They put it on the top shelf and buddy, it moved crowds. I know it works. Paid big money for it. Got it memorized. Want to hear me quote it? And we'd rattle it off like poets. And the devil says, so what? Yeah. But watch, I'll play it for you. And we'll put it in and play it for them. And they say, so? <laughs> so what? What we got is a light bulb. And what we need is to plug it in. Uh -huh. <laughs> Paul said, oh, that I might know him. I might know him. You can know him as a historical figure. You can know him as a religious founder. 
But that's different than knowing Him as Savior, Energizer, Empowerer. One that will be in you to fight your battles when the battle needs to be fought. One that will stand by your sides and make a way where there is no way. One that will take all the forces of hell and earth and turn them to your favor. When you know Him, when you know Him, when you know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering then we'll glorify Him in this hour. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost here this morning. Sit down. All right, Brother Anthony, if you help me. Now, here's the example in Scripture where I just said, read. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them. Okay. Then certain of the vagabond Jews exorcists. Now, watch this. Certain of the vagabond Jews exorcists. Now, they had the blood. They were Jews. They had the profession. They were exorcists. Read. Took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits. Now, they had the blood and they had the profession. Now they took upon them, what? Which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus. They took upon them the name of the Lord. Read. Saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preached. I'm telling you, devils, this thing works. (laughs) He said, devils, y'all listen to me. I saw it work. Uh I saw a man who knew about this Uh name. That's great, right? Walk out there when he said, Jesus! (laughs) Every devil in town packed up and left. Uh Devils, you listen to me. This worked. (laughs) And they took upon themselves. They were the profession. They had the blood. That's great. And in this case, they used the name. Got your light bulb here. Y'all watch this. Audience, watch what I'm fixing to do. Read. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests which did so. Wait a minute. They were, they were kin folks with the priest. They had the papers to prove it. <laughs> sons of Sceva. Sons of the priest. Read. And the evil spirit answered. The evil spirit said, so what? <laughs> Big deal. Jesus, I know. We ain't going nowhere. We're here to stay. Now, boys, Jesus we know. And Paul we know. And this guy Paul, we've had our encounters with him. We know him. Read on. But who are you? But who are y'all? Yeah. <laughs> Don't know anything about you. What he was trying to say is... You've got to know Jesus yourself. That's right. And if you flip that badge and say, I'm of Jesus and Jesus is in me, then we'll leave. But until then, you just got a, a light impact. Uh-huh. Come on, Brother Anthony, we on some more. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on this. One man. Took on seven fakes. <laughs> Come on, help me read. And over, overcame them and prevailed. And he overcame them. Against them. And he prevailed against them. So that they fled out of the house neck and wounded. They left out in bad shape. Thank you, brother. <laughs> and this was known to all the Jews. 
And the embarrassing thing was everybody found out about it. <laughs> That's good. Thank you, Brother Anthony. But I'm telling you that sit here today, you not only do you have the light bulb, but you got the power. I said, you've got the power. All you that feel like I've come here defeated need to do is get a hold of what you got. What you have on the inside. Find your Holy Ghost receptacle and plug up. I'm saying it's time for Jesus to be glorified in this hour. Come on, put your hands together and praise the Lord, everybody. You may be seated. Statistics to show you the negative. There's libraries concerning negative statistics. If I want to bore you today, let me get up here and tell you how many, how many marbles you'd have to stack on each other to reach planet Mars. <laughs> and if we would dissect the hypotenuse of the right triangle of Tripoli, a <laughs> world still says, sir, forget about that. Show me Jesus. I'm saying we need to leave here today plugged up. Know him. And, and, ever say and, 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 the power of his resurrection. And, 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 the fellowship of his suffering. Amen. Listen to me. Hallelujah. The most successful days of my ministry. I'm not bragging. It wasn't when my church board walked in and gave me the keys to one of America's finest luxury cars. Said to me, if that don't please you, go down and get what you want. Here's the checkbook. That wasn't my most successful day. And that's not why these brethren, whoever was responsible for asking to come and share my testimony today, that's not what brought me here. But it was that day. When I, when I walked into a church that had that already been rolled off. And I said, Good. My, I told my wife, I said, honey, we have but one hope. I said, I'm going to the church, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to touch God. And if I don't touch Him... I had the light bulb, had the prettiest church in town, but you could shoot two loads of birdshot through it and not touch a soul in it. That's how empty it was. When you walk down the streets, they spit at your feet when you said Pentecost. Bad reputation. That's I went to that church and I closed the door and I said, God... I don't come out until I touched you. <laughs> or they haul me out as a corpse. I must know him. Yes, I can say his name. I can quote his word. But I must know him. 
as being more than a political, I mean a historical figure. I must know him as being more than a religious founder or originator. I must know him in the power of his resurrection. And I must know him in the fellowship of his suffering. And then I turn the lights on. On that fourth day, I had fasted until I was so weak and I thought I was going to die. I got up and I walked over to the pew to rest. And Brother Cole, I don't know if I fainted or what happened, but I went out. And while I was out, I saw our church. Beautiful building, glass front on a thoroughfare. Amen. Cars passing it. In my vision, I got out in the, in the street and flagged them down. And they just drove by me saying, so what? So what? Finally, I turned and said, Lord, what's the problem? He said, look at it. It's dark. That you got the fixture, but you don't have any power to it. And then he said, if you'll teach my people to fast, to pray, to worship, and to witness... He said, I'll turn this on. I looked and his finger was touching every brick. Somebody said, I don't believe in that. Don't worry, you'll never see it. People in mock with it mock you that try to get a hold of God said, I can't tell the difference between a bean dream and a godly dream. Then leave them both alone, honey. Sit down. And I saw that building light up until shafts of light shone across that, that thoroughfare. And I saw men in that vision that's come into the church today, 27 years later, that the Holy Ghost convicted and brought in. Hallelujah. And then I looked and that church was a fire. It was lighted as bright as one of these powerful lights here, shining. And I got up and I staggered back to my car and I got in it and I drove home. And I said, honey, it's all right now. I've heard from God. We figured to have some lights in the old dark place. Yeah. Fellowship of his sufferings. Yeah. Hallelujah. And that Wednesday night, there was a, a hippie that walked in the church, bushy hair and long beard. And uh, our whole congregation was there, all six of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny now, Brother Cole, but it wasn't funny then. And in that building, they would seat 500 people, us six folks sat and had church. And here come that boy in that church with that beard and, and hair and everything that goes with that hippie life of that, of that age. And in his arms, he carried a little girl who was wearing braces. Her feet would turn 50 degree angles. Amen from normal. After I got through preaching on the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, he stood and come down that aisle crying. and said, Preacher! If you believe what you preach, this baby's going to be here. I said, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm preaching. If you go home and give your best to the seeking of absorbing and receiving Jesus into your life as your energizer, I'm saying He'll be there with you when everything is dark and He'll make the way where there is no way. Hallelujah! You may be seated. And buddy, when the church prayed, hallelujah, while we were standing at that altar, the bones snapped and popped, and the feet straightened. 
took those braces off and she walked out. And she's never wore braces since. I baptized her dad in Jesus' name. He got the Holy Ghost. And he's one of our preachers in Covington, Louisiana right now. Building a great church for Jesus Christ. Sirs, it may be dark. Sirs, it may be gloomy. But sirs, it's a good time for the Lord to be glorified. Are you ready to glorify Jesus? Come on, put your hand together and praise the Lord. I'm running out of time. Brother Jones, Brother Hoging, Brother Paul, come up here. You may be seated. I'm running out of time. I'm in closing. It's going to take four things for us to reach our generation now. You cannot do without fasting, prayer, worship, and witness. And then it's going to take each other. We have to work together. I have a ministry. But the Tanny, it may not mean much to you. I may not give you very much, but every morning, about daylight, I call your name in prayer. For the Williams, every morning, about daylight, I pray for you. That may not mean much to you. It may not be much to your ministry. But somewhere back here, among all these thousands, I stand. But Barnes, I do the same for you. Matthew, Brother Anthony, Brother Williams, Brother Cole, I pray for you every day. It may not be much to you here, but somewhere out there, I want you to know I'm on the team. And if the light can burn in Alexandria, somehow a little afterglow will reach over to them springs and help me. Now, this is what I close with. <clears throat> On the shores of Normandy, Manila Beach, Water Canal, Iwo Jima, are fields of white crosses. And all that marks and tells about who lays there is these words, known only to God. And that person laying there may have been the man that hand carried the grenade to the machine gun battery that wiped them out that his comrades could go forth and wave that old star spangled banner of victory. But their names will ever be known. No portrait will ever be written about them. No song ever composed about them. But I would not be a free American today had it not been for those unknown soldiers. I don't deserve standing here. Some of you out there that sold your refrigerator, hawked your, your washing machine or your dryer just to get here. You need to be up here telling of your victories. Yes. You ever hear of a man by the name of Henderson that lived once in Livingston Parish? I doubt it. But that old man went to Denham Springs, stood at the end of a cow path. When the city would not sell him property, And made a prophecy and said, This cow path will one day be a traffic artery, the main one of the town. And this little white building that I preach at will one day be one of the largest churches in the district. None of y'all know his name. I didn't know him, Brother Tenney, until the night of my dedication, and his daughter walked in and told me the story. Yes, sir. Untold names and unsang heroes. 
is a part of my success today. Amen. And we need every one of them. I said we need every one of them. Amen. Come here, Brother Jones. Hallelujah. A few years ago, this good man walked into my church and said, I'd like to come to church here. And I looked at him. I said, man, yeah. I could tell from the first handshake that he had potential. Brought him in. Tried to put some ideas that I had in his mind. He took off with the torch. Amen. He's now building a fine church in South Baton Rouge. The other day, the other day we took up thirty thousand dollars in this in our church, gave it to him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's building a church. Has at least two hundred people now. And the reason he ain't got four hundred, he ain't got no place to put them. But when he gets a building to put him in, he'll be back here one day on. with the power of a report of victory. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Brother Hogan came to us. He's with the Spanish ministry. We spent right at $150,000 last year remodeling the old church so that he could come there and be proud of the Spanish people that he brings and makes them proud. Amen. Of a place to worship. Not only is God blessing them spring with a powerful Spanish work. But around our area, Brother Hogan is being used to help plant some Spanish congregations all through that country. Come on, church. It's time for Jesus to be glorified. Come here, Brother Paul. Now, here's one I'm proud of. Hallelujah. He's from the state of Arizona. He was working with a contractor out there who left our church, went out to preach, uh, to work out in Arizona. On the job, this contractor witnessed to Brother Paul. If he could tell you the story, he'd scare all of you about his life. My wife told him yesterday, said, Brother Paul, if you told me all this before we went out there, I wouldn't have baptized you. I've been afraid of you. <laughs> Amen. But he got the Holy Ghost. Somebody taught him a Bible study. I got on a plane and flew out there. Baptized him in a horse trough. Right by Mustang Mountain. Cowboy stuff, ain't it? Amen. Hallelujah. But now he knows the home Bible study backward and forward. He's teaching four studies himself. Called his wife this morning while he came to the call of the time. His wife didn't get him another class to teach. There's a bunch of more folks in that church that's teaching classes. Thank you, Brother Paul. Hallelujah. Come on, we can double. I said, we can double. Yes, there's a lot of negative out there. But it takes the negative for the positive to work. I'm saying, don't look at the negative. Look at Jesus Christ in us. For he that's within you is greater. 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 It's time that the Son of Man be glorified. One more quick. Show you how hungry our world is. Amen. Whenever and how anxious God is to bless us all some, when we sent these group off to start these churches in every case, God gave us twice as many as we sent out. Right. I was preaching another, uh, a few weeks, uh, last year, well, last year I was preaching on the, on the Mideastern crises. And the athletic, assistant athletic director of LSU came to hear my presentation. They'd been to every church in town. I mean, they were fancy folks. When, when Reagan came down and visited Baton Rouge in his administration, this is one of the families that entertained Reagan when he was in town. This man who spoke all over the United States and many countries in Europe, fine man, amen, tried every church in town, and he wasn't satisfied. Came to our church, heard me preach. He told the man that brought him, he said, you reckon that guy uh, uh, teach me a Bible study? <laughs> Reckon. I went there. It was supposed to have been for 12 lessons. I stayed in his home for eight and a half months. Yeah, and here's the 
Yes, I pastor. Yes, I preach. Yes, I work. But I am never too busy to fly to Arizona if necessary. Teach a home Bible study to an elite or a beggar. Church, they ain't injured in my fine car. And they ain't injured in my fancy suit and my exotic shoes. They're saying, Sam, we would see Jesus. The short of that story is he got the Holy Ghost. His wife got the Holy Ghost. All of his family got the Holy Ghost. and baptized a whole bunch of them in Jesus' name. He went back to LSU and he's teaching the, the, uh, the, uh, the maids there and the people in his office. He got me another class and he has me two coaches from LSU and their wives in that class. Brother Tony Roberts and I are teaching that class. Not only that, there's a man in my town, Brother Tony, I've reached for for 27 years. Coach was friends with him, got him and his wife in it. Another fine businessman in that town that everybody in town wanted, got him and his wife in the class. The third businessman, hallelujah, in another little town close to us, out at Walker, has a fine business. Amen. Had him and his wife in that class. In that one class, I got back more than I sent over to Amit to our daughter work over there. That pastor couldn't be with us today. Praise God. And from another class, from two classes I'm teaching myself, God gave me more back, more back than I sent out. Hallelujah. When I baptize these people in Jesus' name and they get the Holy Ghost, I will shake Livington Parish like she's never been shaken before. Church, we would see Jesus! Will God provide the need? Yes, He will. When I sent those people over to Amit to start that church out there, I began to teach a lady from Amit. And about the third or fourth lesson, she said, Brother Johnson, I want to do something for the church. I'm pledging four acres of ground on Highway 16 for the new church. Church, we would see Jesus. Yeah.